Hello and welcome. My name is Anita Kress and I am the Webinar Production Assistant of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data Webinar Series with host Adrian Bowles. <coughs> Today Adrian will discuss artificial general intelligence. When can I get it? Uh, okay, that's my inference in there, but um, <laughs> just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag SmartData. If you would like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our series speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage areas include cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, Wiley 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SUNY Binghamton and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Great. Well, thank you, Anita. It's uh, nice having you on, on the other end of the line today. It's a, I can't say that it's a welcome change because that would be bad for Shannon, but Glad to have you in the in that role, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. <laughs> that was just a test to see if your microphone was still on. Okay, so artificial general intelligence, and I'm going to use the Anita variant. Where when can I get it? Um, that's good emphasis. Today, what we want to do is talk about the the area of research of artificial general intelligence. I'm going to start out by um, presenting kind of a foundations um, section that looks at how we got to where we are today in AI and um, artificial general intelligence and what are the differences. I'm going to spend a few minutes on the importance of building systems to play games and why that's been uh, sort of the way we've approached, we as an industry have approached a lot of these problems uh, simulating uh, natural intelligence. Then take a quick look at AGI today, uh, some of the approaches that people are working on, some interesting research that's out there, give you a couple of examples. And then talk about um, the difference between artificial and augmented general intelligence. And finally, uh, as we promised in the abstract, uh, give you sort of the criteria that I use when I talk to vendors that, uh, that suggest that they have an AGI solution. What are the questions that we ask, and how do we determine whether or not uh, they're actually making progress? So, we'll get right into the foundations. Uh, for those of you that have been on some of the webinars in this series before, to be a uh, very slight overlap today, two or three slides. But I wanted to kind of set the uh, set the scene, if you will, um, as if you hadn't been with us at all before. So we're going to start out by looking at modern AI versus the AI roots. And uh, I'm gonna go into more detail today than I have in any of the other sessions in terms of sort of the historical um, foundations, because I think it's really interesting to see how um, the, the field, if you will, started out in one direction with one set of beliefs. And um, I don't claim to have been there. This is when I was uh, about two or three years old when you see the, uh, the dates on this. But looking at what AI was at the very beginning, what it became, and where we're going today in terms of um, where, where we want to, in some cases, replace 
natural intelligence, if you will, uh, replace people uh, in specific tasks, but more likely in most of the things that uh, most of the systems are being built today, they're really um, not so much automating, they're augmenting intelligence. And when you see things, we, we did a session last week at the um, Dataversity Smart Data Conference in California on AI and cognitive computing in the future of work. Much of the talk about uh, job displacement or replacement with AI is really focused on um, robotic process automation, which is sort of distinct. It's, it's taking routine tasks and automating them, but not adding intelligence. So we're going to look at this and, and kind of get a, a sense of uh, where is the market today, what are the opportunities, and how do we go uh, forward. So the very beginning, back in 1955, and I'll try not to get into the uh, recovering academic mode today. We're not going to go through all the details here. But this is... Um, by all accounts, when we think of um, artificial intelligence, this was the beginning. In 1955, um, a proposal was submitted to have a conference in 1956 at Dartmouth to do a summer research project on artificial intelligence. And the reason I'm going to spend a few slides on this is because it really does um, give you a, a good understanding of what was believed at the outset and what they were trying to accomplish. And so just a couple of points here. This is the actual, uh, or from the actual proposal. So the study, and this was um, a proposal because they wanted to get funding for, uh, for a summer program. But the conjecture is that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence, now they're talking natural intelligence, can in principle be so price precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. And simulate it's an important uh, word because we'll look and see the difference between um, sort of modeling something and mimicking it. And here, they're just saying, we can do it because the, the principles are that we can break everything down into component parts and automate them on a computer. And again, uh, historical context, 1955. They want to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve problems now reserved for humans, and this last part is really important, and improve themselves. It was a pretty bold attempt, and I love this, uh, this last line. I added the emphasis here, but we think a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work together on it for a summer. 1955, they wanted funding to have 10 people get together and make progress on one or more of these areas. So. There are seven areas that they laid out as uh, foundation areas for artificial intelligence. I'm going to go through them quickly, and we're going to see uh, sort of where we are and, and how things have evolved. And at the very end, we're going to come back and look at these seven to see what is still to be done. First one's pretty straightforward. If a machine can do a job, then a calculator can be programmed to simulate the machine. So here, they were recognizing the the limitations in the 50s of uh, speed and memory for computers, but the idea is that it's not it, the um, the stumbling block wasn't the machine capacity, but it was the inability to write programs to take full advantage of what they had. Now, as someone who did my first um, natural language processing uh, program back in 1978 on a mainframe using 64K, 64,000 bytes. Um, I would have to say it's not just that, uh, that we couldn't take advantage of what we had. It's that we didn't have much when you put it in the scale of um, how natural intelligence, how biological intelligence uh, uses resources. But that was the first one. Now, this second one uh, is fundamental, again, to um, the beginning of AI. How can a computer be programmed to use a language? And I'll tell you right now, we're going to come back to this uh, language. Uh, we did a session last year, and I did a tutorial last week on natural language processing and how much we have advanced. But the, the key word here is use a language, not understand the language. All right. So the speculation was that a lot, of, a lot of human thought is manipulating words according to rules of reasoning, rules of conjecture. So they were taking a very... Um, 
almost a, a mechanical approach to uh, how people do things. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about anthropomorphizing on machines. This is sort of the inverse. We're saying that we think that people are processing uh, language uh, in a way that maps nicely to what we have in a computer. So it hasn't been precisely formulated, but this was the idea. So that was the second quote. The third one you'll recognize if you've been following um, what's happening in AI today, that right at you know the beginning in 1955, using neural nets or neuron nets as it was called then, how can a set of hypothetical neurons be arranged to form concepts? There's a lot of theoretical work. They said that the problem needs more theoretical work. This is something that um, was really uh, the subject of a lot of research early on, and then it fell out of fashion. And certainly, if you've been following uh, almost anything in AI in recent years, you'll know that the the idea of neural nets um, as, as sort of a, a part of the foundation of just about everything we do today in machine learning. But that was right there at the beginning. The fourth one, um, theory of the size of a calculation. If given a well-defined problem, so you, you can, you can um, when in their terminology there for well-defined, you can know if an answer is uh, valid or not. Looking at, instead of trying to do a brute force approach to problem solving, using every possible path. Um, the, the issue for AI was um, building something that could um, have a theory, building a theory, uh, to determine the complexity of functions. That's not something that we generally think of as a, as a hot AI area today, but at the end, uh, in the summary, we'll talk about kind of how that got used in uh, most of the things that we've done in the interim. Five, self-improvement. So aspects of the artificial intelligence problem. A truly intelligent machine will carry out activities described as self-improvement. And here, this is kind of interesting. Um, as uh, as Anita mentioned, I started out in uh, psychology. You might start to think of something like a, a Maslow um, self-actualization, that how do you improve yourself uh, based on experience and based on context? Uh, six, number of abstractions can be distinctly defined. And here, we're looking at a direct attempt to classify and to describe machine methods. That's the key, machine methods of forming abstractions from sensory and other data would seem worthwhile. Now, the, uh, one of the keys in here is from sensory data. There's nothing in the list for this uh, 1956 conference that explicitly looked at um, auditory input or uh, machine vision, but this is where it fits under um, deriving abstractions from sensory data. And finally, uh, an attractive and clearly incomplete conjecture. I love this, that the even the conjecture is um, incomplete. The difference between creative thinking and unimaginative competent thinking is in the injection of some randomness but the randomness has to be guided by intuition to be efficient. In other words, the educated guess or the hunch include controlled randomness. And that's something that we have to kind of, uh, as, as we look at some of these approaches, we'll see that this is an area that just sort of dropped off um, the map in the last 60 or so years. So at the beginning, that, oops, sorry, at the beginning, that's, um, where the early definition of artificial intelligence came from. Those were sort of the, the, the seven major areas, and there were sub areas, as I said, for things like machine vision. So, where does AGI, or artificial general intelligence, fit? And in this diagram, what I'm attempting to do is just sort of give the, the simplest view of the world when we think of AGI, because it's a term that's uh, been in and out of favor over the last, let's say, decade. The, the two major dimensions that I want you to think about, and there's some minors that we'll, we'll get into, are is the learning model, the way the system learns, something that is guided by external, um, external guidance, like interaction with a human being, or is it something that is internal as it processes the data? And this 
we don't have to think about this as um, something that's purely analogous to machine learning, but the idea is that when we talk about learning in any of the AI um, situations or contexts, um, we may try and approach it with a model of how humans learn, uh, whether we're doing things that are supervised learning where you're training somebody or something that's uh, unsupervised and there's discovery, something that you uh, learn by observation. Um, so the question is, how does this system learn? And then on the vertical axis, the, the knowledge domain, we can either have systems that um, they're very narrowly focused, they're constrained, they're looking at one uh, type of uh, problem, one um, maybe one profession, one uh, one activity. We tend to break things up either by vertical markets, and maybe we're looking at uh, the practice of medicine. Within there, we may be looking at oncology. Within there, we may be looking at a subset that's uh, constraining it, or we may be looking at roles, activities that go across businesses. But as you broaden the lens and go from a narrow or constrained domain to something that's um, very broad or unbounded, if you have something that uh, a system that can operate in multiple domains so that it either has the knowledge to begin with in all domains, and we'll talk about how that's um, been attempted, or something that can acquire knowledge um, on demand in any domain, and it doesn't require external um, input or support to do the learning as it crosses domains, that's where AGI, or artificial general intelligence, fits. The other side of the spectrum, when you have um, something where there's either more uh, interaction required, more support required in terms of the training and the learning, or that you very uh, narrowly define the domain, then you're getting into specialized um, so some people call that weak AI versus strong AI, another term for artificial general intelligence. It's really a question of um, sort of scope and approach. And to put that in context, um, what I refer to here is kind of classic AI, uh, which is the way problems were attempted up until mm, maybe five to 10 years ago. You know, the, if, if you look at what was proposed for Dartmouth, it was the full range. Everything uh, could be solved, everything could be automated, everything could be identified, partitioned, and taken down to that fine level. Um, so at the very beginning, in the 50s, when they were looking at AI without using the term general, it was an attempt to create a um, what we think of today as AGI. That very quickly uh, narrowed the focus, and so most of the work in AI from the late uh, 50s into the 60s and 70s certainly into, even into the 80s, was uh, what I'm referring to here as classic. It's fairly narrow. You'd be looking at a problem like perception or understanding or planning or learning, but the domain um, that was being um, automated or augmented or artificially created was generally pretty limited. And I used a, a diagram like this recently to show that um, the, the two fundamental approaches, we can be doing everything simulated in software. There's very little work in the 50s and 60s um, in specific hardware for um, for AI that changed 70s and 80s as a sort of a hot, hotbed of activity in creating hardware that attempted to mimic um, biological systems. But you could either mimic or model. And if we look at it today, uh, modern AI, which is classical AI uh, problem solving, plus machine learning, and uh, just to reinforce it, but I'm saying here in terms of machine learning, what's old is new again. Uh, what we're doing today in uh, machine learning, although there have been many advances, is largely what was anticipated as part of the, um, the original definition of AI but it fell from favor so hard and for so long, but I think of it as, as new again. And the other big component here is uh, the ability to uh, manage big data. And we'll see in a minute how that's uh, influenced the way people are designing these systems. So today, most of what we see in AI is still fairly narrow. We can 
look at it again, still with a hardware or software focus. That could be um, that could be the fundamentals that we would use for general intelligence, but most of the effort has been very um, a very narrow scope. So what I want to do now is take a look at um, one more piece of the, the puzzle today, which is cognitive computing. And that's one of the areas I spend a lot of time in. Um, this is part of the, the webinar that we did last month where we're looking at systems that are attempting to um, model or, or mimic, mostly model, um, human cognition, which I break into four categories, uh, understanding, reasoning, learning, and planning, and they're all interdependent. Uh, and if you're interested in that and you want to talk about more detail, catch me offline. Um, we have some materials on this. But again, it, it is something where the model that captures the, the corpus, all the information that you're going to use as the basis for decision making, today we're still dealing with one domain at a time in just about all of these systems. So it's not what we think of as AGI. And there's so much confusion based on uh, marketing that I just have to put this up. So, you know, when you're looking at Google Home or Siri or, or the Amazon um, Echo, you hear a lot of claims that um, that are hard to, to live with if you're working in this uh, part of the industry. There's um, there's no doubt that each of these devices is much much more advanced than anything that we had just a few years ago in terms of um, natural language understanding. But the understanding that they have is really at a level that just allows it to, um, to, to be used in search, lookup, uh, some context within a specific domain. It doesn't take long to kind of get to the point where uh, you nobody's going to be fooled that you're talking to a person, right? So understanding is, is very different from recognition. I'm going to come back to that. But these um, the the issue is if any one of these devices had appeared 20 or 30 years ago, we would have just said, "Wow, that is artificial intelligence." You know, it, it's so far ahead. But really. What we have here is some good technology, some good subset technology, if you will. And I think it's a great start for um, for uh, sort of socializing or getting people ready for the next wave. And with that, I'm just going to make a, a couple of points on, on how these things are, are perceived in the world. So this is going back now um, 10 years, a little over 10 years, a CNN article, AI set to exceed human brain power. and it's it's great to take a look at something you know that's just uh, a decade old and see that it always seems that what we're looking at is about to change the world. Now that's not to say that it it isn't really this time, but we were looking at exceeding human brain power, and it's so narrowly defined. There is some concern in the industry and and then you know, uh, computer science in general that the claims that have been made, things like this with human brain power and then people seeing uh, devices uh, from Siri to Echoes, et cetera, that, uh, that there's going to be a backlash. And the last several times that's happened in AI, it was followed by uh, uh, what was called a, an AI winter which is really defined in terms of a lack of ability to deliver on marketing claims. That's how I'm going to define it, which was followed by uh, disillusionment, which was followed by a drop in investment, which um, turned away the research. So I'm just going to make the, the statement now that I think that we're not in any danger at this point, um, contrary to some speculation that I've seen recently of an AI winter. We're actually in the spring. And there's just a slide here and another one from a report that we did um, on the machine learning markets that the VC ecosystems are building up 
and just about anything out there today that has AI in the title is getting funded. Some of it may be ridiculous. Uh, sometimes it's being um, what they call an aqua hire instead of an acquisition that little companies are getting bought just for the talent before they actually get any uh, product out. But what I think is interesting here, I can just, um, I'll go to the next one, um, that companies are getting money from a variety of uh, sources. And it used to be that most of the AI research was government funded. There's still some, you know, quite a bit. Uh, the Synapse project that I may talk about later, but the one here under digital reasoning where it's uh, InQtel. InQtel is a venture arm of the U.S. intelligence community. And uh, if you're interested in this market, I encourage you to take a look at anything they say publicly about who they've invested in, because one of the big areas for them is investing in AI technology that is believed will have an impact on national security and intelligence. So uh, the fact that they're still putting money in uh, to me says that we're, we're pretty far from um, an AI winter. But anyway, with all of that and all of the stuff that we've seen, there's a, uh, a tendency in some of the press to say, well, we've solved the problem. And this is an article from uh, last year, the Financial Times, after Google's AlphaGo um, beat a, a master in the game of Go, that this AI thinks like humans do. They learn and improve over time. And I'm just going to throw it out there now, and then we'll get into some more of the details. That's complete rubbish. Um, AlphaGo does not think like humans do any more than I think like a rock does. It's a completely different approach, and it, it's it's this is more dangerous, uh, that belief that the, the thinking process is the same as a human than most things in the technology. So quickly moving on. The, the issue for a lot of these systems is that they're looking for a pattern. And they say that, you know, the system has learned. And then this, uh, this reference here, building high-level features using large-scale unsupervised learning. That was a famous example um, submitted back in 2011. This is when uh, Google built a system with 1,000 machines using 16,000 cores and analyzed images uh, without, they were unlabeled images, so it was uh, unsupervised here. And uh, the system learned, and I'm using air quotes here, to recognize cats. All right, and that's something that uh, certainly five, definitely 10 years ago, uh, it was almost unimaginable that you could do something that fast uh, and do it at a level of accuracy better than humans uh, today. Um, using machine learning. But we talk about learning and we talk about uh, image recognition. I want to make a, a very key point here. Recognition is not understanding. That system still didn't know the difference between a cat and a dog. It knew nothing less about cats than a three-year-old would. And so uh, I've been thinking about how to make this uh, a clear point because it the lines are getting so blurred. But we can build systems to recognize things. We can build them to recognize relationships. We can build them uh, to do statistical modeling. We can have a model, uh, as we've discussed in, in earlier webinars, that uh, makes some assumption about where a representation of an item fits in memory and how, if our, our model is correct, then the representation of Object X and object Y is stronger if they're closer together in memory. But I'm just going to say one more time, recognition is not understanding. I recognize my wife. I recognize North Korea. I don't really understand either of them. Okay. Now we're going to quickly switch into games and AI and AGI. It's one of the cooler areas. So is it AI or isn't it AI? We're looking at three here that we'll go into in a little more detail. The first one is um, the uh, the chess competition with uh, Gary Kasparov. 
and the second one is IBM Watson, and the third is last year's AlphaGo, uh, the game of Go. Let's get in. Just to, to make sure that we're, we're clear on this, because terms change over time. Uh, I love this, this um, article title, If It Works, It's Not AI. This was uh, just a few years ago, like 1977. But it's true today. Once something is in production and it's all around us, we don't tend to think of it as AI anymore. And I had a, someone who probably should have known better who was writing about this recently, and they said, well, you know, uh, we had all this expert system stuff and knowledge-based system stuff in the 80s, and where is it today? Well, the fact is it's in most business applications. We have business rules processes. We have business um, rules engines that use um, pretty straightforward um, logic and reasoning. But once we get into production, we tend to stop thinking of it as AI. So it's like that moving target. And that's important when I talk about uh, my own views on AGI. So why do we do these games, and what have we learned from them, and what is generalizable? So uh, back in 1956, Arthur Samuel at IBM built a system to uh, play checkers. The key thing there was looking at the rules, and how do people play it, and how do you anticipate? Now, checkers, of course, uh, is a two-person uh, game. It's perfect information. You can see, you know what the rules are. There are a constrained set of rules. You know what the other person has. You know what their options are. And so you're trying to look ahead and place a value on it. Uh, and it's zero sum. If you do something that gains you um, a score, it has to come at the expense of someone else. Chess is the same way. It's a very similar uh, game. Obviously, there are more, um, more potential moves. And going three moves ahead in chess, uh, the combinatorics of figuring out uh, what all the combination, what all the possibilities are, is much more difficult in chess. And that's why. Uh, frankly, it took from the late 1950s until the end of last century to build a system that could look ahead and analyze the moves uh, in a way that was competitive. But just as I criticized the, the Financial Times article for saying it did it the way a, a person does it, um, chess grandmasters don't do that. They don't look ahead 10 moves and analyze every possible combination. There are different uh, patterns that they're looking at that the machine isn't. And so it's solving the same problem in a very different way, uh, taking advantage of its strengths. AlphaGo is a much more complicated uh, game, again, in terms of combinatorics. And a lot of people thought this wouldn't have been solved uh, for several more years. But last year, using uh, dedicated hardware, dedicated software, um, massively parallel software, uh, the Google system, AlphaGo, uh, beat a grandmaster. So now the question is, is that something, that's a very specialized application. It's very specialized data, very specialized rules. It's certainly not uh, general intelligence. But we start to look and say, are there things in each of these that we can apply to the acquisition of general knowledge to use for general intelligence. A little bit uh, more advanced, when we look at uh, the Watson system for Jeopardy in 2011, now we're talking about a three-person game, or two people in a machine in that case. But the big difference is here. It's still zero sum. If you gain some points, it comes at the expense of someone else. But we're dealing with imperfect information and natural language. Now, this starts to get to the type of system that we're talking about that can um, learn, and learn is always in air quotes here. Uh, we can represent things in a way that we can apply formal reasoning techniques and probabilistic techniques to make some hypotheses and generalize and have um, evidence-based processing. So this is the first of these game-based systems uh, that I think is already generalized. Um, the Jeopardy game is an open domain um, game, so it could have been any topic. And then uh, poker. Oh, sorry, I thought there was something on the line. It's actually uh, something outside the house. We've just had a major storm here in Connecticut. So poker, uh, 
very different from Jeopardy. It's a multiplayer game. It's imperfect information again. It is zero sum. Um, but there's the issue of, um, I'll just go to the next slide, why, why this is a big deal. Because in poker, the problem was just solved this year, basically, or solved in terms of a level of competence. Um, you're dealing with uh, imperfect information. You don't know what the other people have. You know what's, uh, what's showing on the table. But there's this betting and bluffing. And this, similar in, in one way to what I was describing with Watson, now we're dealing with generalized learning and problem solving skills that bring in much more than just um, knowledge of the rules. We start to look at uh, things like emotion and risk tolerance and uh, profiles. So this to me was a, a huge thing that uh, just recently we got to the point where there was a poker playing system. This was out of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, that's playing at a tournament level. Okay. With real reason, another reason that I want to talk uh, for a minute about poker, even though I don't play the game, is that, um, sorry, going back to, to chess, poker is important because there's this um, betting, which we also saw in Jeopardy. If you've seen the game, there is some uh, area where you're making a bet. Uh, dealing with uncertainty. With chess, it's reached the point that certainly the, the best of the chess uh, programs with dedicated software uh, are playing at world championship levels. But what's happened recently is um, sort of a change to the game that the game can be played with teams that are mixed with people and machines. And the reason I, I bring this up is because we, we often talk about the difference between artificial and augmented for um, AI and AGI both. Is it something where you're trying to uh, simulate or replace or supplant uh, an individual doing the job, you're trying to do it better, or you're trying to make them better at what they do? And in a recent competition, one of these crowdsourced things, uh, the team that won actually used perhaps a, a less sophisticated um, version of, uh, of chess programming, but use that to guide and inform uh, the team that made the actual decisions. And so what's uh, interesting to me looking at this as we start to look at the, the field of general intelligence is what happens when we try and augment it, make everybody smarter and give people access to these systems. And so this is one of the first ones I think is um, is an indication of where things are going uh, in other domains. All right, AGI today. When we talk about the I in AI and AGI, it's intelligence. And when we talk about natural intelligence, uh, the, the sort of standard metric that we use for people is what's their IQ, what do they know? Now, going back um, you know, well over 100 years, IQ has been measured using a number of factors. So uh, Charles Spearman was one who there was IQ tests before him, but he looked at it as a factor analysis taking correlations between multiple tests that were testing different things. And the idea of this G factor or general factor is that IQ, there's some general ability that we measure, and then there's some narrow ability factors. It's kind of like, uh, I've uh, got teenagers uh, dealing with things like the SATs, right? You're looking for some natural ability, but you have to express that in a standardized form, and that's where the, the general test comes in. And then you have narrow ability factors, and you kind of factor all of those in uh, to decide arbitrarily, I guess, um, I would have to say, if, if someone is intelligent or not. The problem is, when we're trying to say, is one system more intelligent than another, or has the system uh, reached a level of intelligence in a domain or across domains? There's nothing like that for AI. We don't have um, an IQ test. I mean, you could um, certainly build systems to perform on an IQ test, but there's no direct analogy for machine intelligence. So the problem 
as I see it, in looking at artificial general intelligence versus natural general intelligence is we have to, in most cases, get away from trying to do this mimicry. And you may have seen this before. I've used this slide in a different context. But human cognition, we're dealing with 100 billion neurons between 100 and 500 trillion synapses. Um, it really doesn't make sense at today with the technology that we have to try and build um, any system uh, that's dependent on a direct mapping to this architecture. So instead, the minimum requirements today for an AGI system are either to have what I call big knowledge and modest processing or big processing and big data. And the way I look at this is if we're trying to build a system that can be uh, operate with minimal external influence, uh, so you think of somebody as being intelligent, they don't need to actually interact with the community to increase their knowledge. If they have access to data, which may be uh, experience in the real world, or it may be um, from a library, you can get that knowledge. So if we build an AGI system, you either need to have a body of knowledge, this corpus across domains, and then you would just have uh, perhaps modest processing. You still need to have some sort of a reasoning engine and a way of managing knowledge and a way of taking knowledge that you already have and creating new knowledge out of it, if you will, from the, the reasoning. Or you have to have a lot of data and really um, enormous processing power. And the reason I put it in those terms is because if you have, um, if you don't have that corpus to begin with, that body of knowledge that crosses um, all these domains, then every time you're working on uh, solving a problem, you need to uh, derive the knowledge that's relevant to the problem. So that's that's a different approach. And what we'll see is that there are actually a couple of systems that are being developed that take um, one or the other of these, these approaches. So in the design choice uh, for AI in general and general AI in particular, we generally, we we have to start out, um, I'm overloading the terms here, saying either we're dealing with symbolic logic and processing, uh, mechanical theorem proving using um, symbolic logic, where everything has to be represented in uh, unambiguous terms, and then we can process and, and try and uh, either do deductive logic, which of course goes from you know the clauses and will, if all your premises are um, defined accurately, you'll have complete confidence in, in the result, or uh, inductive where you're trying to, to um, go bottom up and, and create a hypothesis and you're dealing probabilistically, or uh, starting with a statistical model where you're just looking for these relationships. And I put the, the lines going back and forth and say, yeah, we're, we're starting with one or the other, but in general, it's kind of a hybrid approach where you're going to be using some statistical models to back up what you have with your um, symbolic um, logic. Some of the approaches that have been taken, and just um, give you kind of the, the overview, and then we'll look at two in particular, either to focus on human interaction, the MIT COG project uh, has actually been retired at this point, but that was an early one, to uh, say that the, the hypothesis was that human intelligence required experience from interacting with other um, humans, and that's you know, based on uh, a psychosociological approach to uh, to learning that says we learn from experience, but we learn from interaction. Uh, focus on machine learning or focus on capturing common knowledge. We all know that common knowledge isn't common. Uh, one approach is to focus on the brain-inspired architectures, and we don't have time to you know, go into that as well as all the software ones. Um, but if you're interested, those are uh, some of the hardware models like the Synapse project that I mentioned earlier. Or focus on representation. And this is where we get into philosophy and linguistics and where there's still some fundamental um, debates in the, uh, in the field. But let's look at two now that I think are really interesting um, and representative of the work that's going on today in um, general intelligence. So OpenCOG, the article here, um, if, if I have anything on here that uh, isn't obvious from the, the slides and you want to 
a copy or a, a reference, just send me an email after the talk, and I'll be happy to, to get you the original reference. So OpenCog is a framework for artificial general intelligence. And if any of you were at the um, Smart Data Conference last week, uh, I was lucky to introduce Ben Gertzel, who was uh, the co-author of this, and was one of the um, leading thinkers in artificial general intelligence. OpenCog has been around for about a decade now, and is now um, the upper right, the OpenCog uh, Foundation. Um, they're actually building a uh, system and tools. Uh, they have an interesting uh, knowledge management system that uses uh, hypergraphs to capture and manage and model knowledge uh, in a hypergraph, unlike a real graph. In a regular graph, a, um, an edge is connected by two vertices. Uh, a vertex can have any number of edges um, attached to it, but in a hypergraph, an edge can join uh, any number of vertices. And so they've got an interesting model there that we've been working on for about 10 years, and they have tools uh, that allow you to go out and uh, today uh, start working on this, and some of it's uh, quite open and easy to get started with. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Another approach, uh, Psych, um, and this is uh, one that I, I'm particularly fond of, because anybody who spends uh, this many decades building something in AI, I think is um, should be rewarded. Uh, Doug Lynette uh, also spoke at the conference last week. And he's been working on this project, as is here for 30 years, to create and capture uh, what we think of it as common sense and build this database. Uh, been adding to it uh, year after year. And here's a, a current link. This is uh, OpenSight. And they currently have, uh, let's say, 239,000 terms and over 2 million triples. Sorry. So this is where they've been capturing relationships. It's all in, in English, so that's one constraint. But the attempt to uh, capture common knowledge across domain, which would allow you to do things similar in a way to what uh, Watson had to do on Jeopardy uh, and synthesize it. Here, the difference is that they're building this actual repository of knowledge. And I would encourage you to take a look at that. So those two different approaches that are out there right now. And probably uh, among the leading ones. The alternative or the it's not really an alternative, but another way of looking at it is instead of building um, one universal system, which is what an AGI system would be, is uh, to augment human knowledge. And what I think um, is important to see is you can either build something that's uh, augmented general intelligence or augmented artificial intelligence uh, at the outset. True AGI, if you really had something that was uh, fully cross-spectrum uh, self-learning that could be used as augmented general intelligence. But that's when you get into the issue of at what point do, do we have to have some sort of concurrence and control. So a true AGI can function as augmented general intelligence. Augmented general intelligence doesn't necessarily, um, wouldn't necessarily be uh, usable independently as AGI. So today, uh, most of what we see is augmented. Uh, I go back to a quote that you'll see attributed to a lot of folks. Um, Tom DeMarco, an early software engineering leader, the first person I heard speak of it. A fool with a tool is still a fool. If we're trying to augment general intelligence, uh, the idea is to build systems that know more than you do or can find out more than you do or can um, help you. Um, so that you can make the decision yourself, but make it better. And with that, I'm going to quickly revisit the uh, 1956 list and see where we've come, and then give you my own checklist for how I evaluate these tools, and then open it up to questions. So we had seven things that the, the founders, if you will, the founding fathers uh, of artificial intelligence set out to work on. I would say that in 60 years, we've become pretty adept at programming. They said, number one, 
the limitation was our ability to use the resources. Number two, I would say right now we have an incredible ability here. As long as we um, keep it to the, the term to use a language, uh, I still don't think that we're, we're close to where we want to be in terms of understanding. But since at the outset they said we don't want to be able to have computers use language, that's a big part of the interface today. Neural nets, definitely. Um, even though it went out of favor, it's now the basis for modern learning. Number four, the theory of the size of a calculation. That anybody who's taken a course in uh, fundamentals of algorithms uh, knows that we have uh, a pretty good understanding, well researched, well documented on understanding algorithmic complexity, which it, <coughs> excuse me was fundamental to getting where we are. But the last three, I, I think that in terms of self-improvement, yeah, uh, if we define improvement as learning, then we're okay because we've defined learning in terms of machine learning, which is simply improving performance. But I think the intent was, and still should be, uh, to look at improvement in ways that go beyond that. Abstractions, yeah, I'm gonna give it partial credit. We, we've done uh, some good things in terms of going like uh, machine vision, for example, but this still doesn't have the understanding in that abstraction. That's something that we put in. That's something that's built in even with systems like Psych or OpenCog. There's some judgment there in what abstractions to use when we're building taxonomies and ontologies. Randomness and creativity. Uh, I've never seen a system where the guided randomness is used effectively, but I think that it, it's um, something that we will see. Uh, creativity, of course, uh, we have machines that have done everything recently from uh, writing music to uh, creating a movie trailer by taking clips and showing an audience uh, different alternatives for clips using emotion recognition software and cameras to see what people like and then building around that. So so that may be creative. I'm not really sure I count it. <coughs> um, or creating recipes based on chemical properties, uh, which is heavily statistically based. I think that's interesting, but I think those last three still need a little work. So I'm gonna give you my last slide here is Whenever, as an industry analyst, whenever somebody says, well, we have a product and it's AGI, this is what I go through. First of all, can I see it? Uh, <clears throat> if somebody says, we've got it, we just can't show it to you yet. Uh, no is just my no. It doesn't mean that it isn't, but it means I'm pretty dubious. Key ones. Does it require human intervention to learn about new domains? And that <coughs> is a non-starter for me. If it does, then it's not general intelligence. Excuse me. Can it communicate its findings? Can it ask for help or missing data and knowledge? And I'll give you um, this is a good example of one that can. Um, when they built the instances of Watson for um, acting as a doctor's assistant, and this is augmented now, um, not, um, excuse me, augmented uh, intelligence. Uh, the system can know that there are tests that exist, uh, and if it had the answer to those tests, it could change its confidence in something. So the system can say, I would have more confidence or I would be able to narrow down the options if I had this information. I think that's a requirement, really. And finally, can it learn to learn? It's one thing to uh, have a system that will go out and just look for anomalies or just look for novel patterns. But if it can start to um, build on top of that, like if it is meta learning, you get through all of those hurdles and that's something I really wanna see. So to answer the, the question from the beginning, uh, when can I get it? I'm gonna say not today. There's a lot of work going on and I think that given some of the things that we've seen uh, with Psych and OpenCog in particular, that uh, and then a couple of other folks are doing things with distributed intelligence where it's crowdsourced. I think we're on the verge of seeing some real commercial, commercial systems that would meet all these criteria. And I look forward to uh, having people actually show me in the next year or two 
that they've uh, broken those barriers. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Anita and see if there are any questions that we can answer today. Or here's my contact information. Happy to follow up with you afterwards if there are questions that we don't get to today or that you don't think of today. So thanks. Uh, thank you, Adrian. I uh, a few comments and uh, hopefully a few more questions. Please add your questions down into the Q and A section or even in the chat area, preferably the Q and A. And to answer one of our most common questions, we will be sending a follow up email within two business days with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session, and anything else requested throughout the webinar. Um, we, we've had a few people that uh, have said it was a great presentation and very fascinating. And also, I love this comment, uh, now I can recognize and understand before I could just recognize. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So here's a question. Um, RPA are in hype, uh, some of the vendors are doing with AI focus. Uh, how do you see that market or solutions based uh, on AGI? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Is it RPA, so they're talking robotic process automation? I think so, it says RPA, okay. yes? Yep. Okay. And it says, uh, Let's see. Um, RPA are in high. Uh, some of the vendors are doing uh, AI focus. How do you see that market? Oh, are there any current effective hybrid approaches integrating humans with uh, live, even if weak, AGI? Huh. Any effective, even if weak? Um, you know what, I should probably try and draw, and I, I just didn't think of it until that I heard this question, is sort of a spectrum. You know, AGI is one of those things where um, we probably need a maturity model so we can say, even though AGI by definition these days is strong AI, I think that there is, it's not a simple case of strong versus weak. There are things that are on the way, and so if you're looking at that, um, yeah, you know, there's a couple. Um, I hesitate to, to toss out names of uh, companies uh, that are not really positioned that way, but I'll, I'll just mention a couple. Um, I did uh, use in a, a couple of the tutorials last week an example from a company called uh, Loop AI. And Loop AI has um, an interesting system uh, that uh, one of the things that I, I showed was how it was looking in natural language for um, patterns and relationships. And uh, I gave an example that uh, Loop had shared with me that was uh, from Al Jazeera in Arabic. And it's certainly not something where I even recognized uh, most of the things in the character set, but some of the things that were pulled out of the text were numbers, and by looking at the numbers, I could see that they happened to be uh, aircraft designations. And as I was using this in um, the tutorial last week, I was pointing out that uh, this is a way of um, natural language understanding, again in air quotes, where the system doesn't even need to know what language it's looking at because it's not looking at um, semantics. And somebody in the audience actually you know, recognized all the terms in the, the diagram. We started talking about uh, how things were being laid out. So that's something where it, it, that system can cut across domains and across natural languages. And although I've never heard them claim it in, in these terms, I think that it that would be an interesting um, Example, IBM's Watson cuts across domains like that. Um, again, they're not building it in those terms. Uh, digital reasoning 
is doing some things. Uh, the Loop AI one is the only one that comes to mind that isn't. They all have to have natural language to be able to, to be used like this. Uh, that's the only one that isn't um, attempting to understand the language in a semantic, at a semantic level. But if uh, the person that asked the question wants to follow up, I'd be happy to um, provide some more thoughts on that. Great. Um, we have another question here. Um, OpenPsych is an RDF-based system that is queried using, is it, I'm not sure if it's pronounced Sparkle, S-P-A-R-Q-L. Mm, yep, yep. Uh, is that part of your model? Is that part of my model? Oh, when, when I say the model, um, is that part of my model? To me, the model is is the data and the assumptions. So you, you could think of that as kind of part of the core. That's the data mon. Sorry, Sparkle would be the data management, the data access uh, level. There's nothing about that specifically that is um, uh, cognitive or or AI. But what you're getting access to using it, the data in that graph database, uh, would certainly be part of the model. Great, and uh, thank you, Adrian, for this great presentation and Q and A. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for uh, today. Just to but I'm snowed in. Send me questions. I'm snowed in. It's <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Leave it open for some more questions, and we'll send them so you can answer them in the you know for us in the follow up email. Uh, Sounds good. All right. Well. Um, just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recorded webinar and slides to dataversity.net within two business days. And, uh, and Shannon, our executive ed editor, will send out a follow-up email to let you know the links and other requested information and answers to any outstanding questions. Thank you again for attending today's webinar, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Adrian, for another great day. Thanks. Uh, presentation on smart data. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. Take care.